Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the U.S. CENI, a center of public diplomacy uh, uh, space organized by the Department of State. We're very excited um, for this afternoon's event, uh, event um, from the Environmental Protection Agency um, of the U.S. government on the EPA's role in delivering on President Obama's Clean Action Plan as well as on the Clean Power Plan um, as well. It is uh, the U.S. Center's distinct honor to introduce for opening remarks. Um, the uh, Administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Administrator Gina McCarthy. Um, she was appointed by the President Obama in 2009 as Assistant Administrator for the EPA's Office of Air and Radiation. Administrator McCarthy has been a leading advocate for common sense strategies to protect public health and the environment. And previously, she served as Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. Um, during her career, which spans over 30 years, she has worked at both the state and local levels on critical environmental issues and helped coordinate policies on economic growth, energy, transportation, and the environment. Administrator McCarthy. Thank you. Bonjour, everyone. It's great to be here in Paris, and I'm glad you're all here. Um, I want to begin by thanking our hosts for their tremendous hospitality and the extraordinary work that's gone on to putting uh, on this, this fantastic conference. I want to recognize Tom and all his colleagues at the U.S. Center staff who are making each of these events possible. You know, I want to begin by, by recognizing that since day one, President Obama has understood that climate change is not a distant environmental concern. It's a problem here and now. Since day one in office, it's a problem for your family, it's a problem for my family. It's a problem for families across the globe. It's a matter of public health. It's a matter of our economy. And it's a matter of our national security. Acting on climate is, in short, our moral obligation. As Pope Francis said in his landmark encyclical, the global community must act together for the sake of our children and the vulnerable populations around the world to protect our common home. This is what this conference is all about. You know the facts. 2014 was the hottest year in recorded history, and 2015 is steadily on pace to be the warmest year of all. In the U.S., rising temperatures are bringing more smog, more asthma, longer allergy seasons. These impacts, they threaten the health of our kids, as well as the well-being of our seniors. While extreme storms, fires, and floods put our families, our farms, our businesses, and our coastlines at risk. And we are certainly not alone. In Bangladesh and the Pacific Islands, citizens are retreating from sea level rise in parts of Africa. Droughts are threatening the food supply. And across the Arctic, Summer sea ice is receding at unprecedented levels. Coastlines are eroding, threatening homes and villages that have withstood the challenging Arctic temperatures for hundreds of years. These impacts add up to real sufferings and real instability. In the U.S., our Pentagon has already told us that climate change poses immediate risks to national security. Countries are recognizing the urgency of this challenge like never before. As the world's largest economy and second largest emitter, the United States recognizes our role in both creating the problem of climate change as well as embracing our responsibility to do something about it. To get there, we're going to have to support developing nations through the transition to a cleaner energy economy. We will have to make sure that the job opportunities, the technologies, and the innovations that come along with a clean, low-carbon economy are available for everyone's benefit. Because development needs to continue while we are answering the call and looking at the cleanest solutions available to us today that are at our fingertips, as well as the opportunities and experience we can share and signals we can send into the market about what the technologies of the future need to be and how we can invest in those together. 
But today, let me focus and spend a few minutes on how the U.S. has been making progress domestically and why it has been so important for us to stand up and put real reductions on the table. President Obama singled his intention to lead on this issue when he launched his climate action plan in 2030, and we have made serious progress already, from the way we produce energy in the United States to the way in which we use it. Over the last decade, the United States has cut its total carbon pollution more than any other nation on Earth. And last November, we set a goal of reducing economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 2025. And we're already seeing results that prove we can get the job done while we continue to steadily grow the robustness of our economy. Today, the U.S. is generating three times as much wind power and 30 times as much solar power as we did when this president took office. That is real success. Since the beginning of 2010, the average cost of a solar system in the U.S. has dropped in half, 50 percent. This makes sense today. Today, every major U.S. automaker offers electric vehicles. And since 2009, our auto industry has added more than 250,000 jobs. This is not about balancing the environment and the economy. This is recognizing that the environment is part of the foundation of a growing economy. And private sector investors, including many of the biggest American companies, have already committed billions of dollars to fight climate change and scale up clean energy innovation. They see the problem, and they want to make money on the solutions. That's how it has to work. Now, I'm talking about Apple, Google, Goldman Sachs, Walmart, Kellogg. Wander around, talk to these people. So many others are here who see that climate change is not a business threat as much as it is a business opportunity. And it's time to turn that corner together. So just look at last week's announcement of, business, of Mission Innovation and the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. It's incredible to see the way the private sector is embracing climate action. There are clear signals about where our markets are heading. Clean innovation is being rewarded. That's the trajectory that the United States is already on. And that's the signal we need to send if we want to open up to innovation our future, our clean energy, low-carbon future. Those are the markets where we need to grow jobs as well as investment. Now, the President's Clean Action Plan is driving an accelerated effort to move towards that low-carbon future. We are moving that trend forward and more aggressively. And the whole of U.S. government has mobilized to turn the plan into reality. The Department of Agriculture's Climate Smart Agriculture Initiative will reduce carbon pollution by over 120 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2025, about 2 percent of economy-wide emissions. The Department of the Interior has permitted more than 50 utility-scale renewable energy projects on public lands that will provide more than 24,000 jobs and power more than 4.9 million homes. And they're doing critical work to build resilience in Arctic communities that are on the forefront, on the lines of climate impact. NOAA is developing sophisticated tools to predict weather patterns under different climate scenarios so that we can plan for today, tomorrow, and the future. NASA is using cutting-edge technologies to observe these Earth system challenges. And our agencies are working together to unleash data and to provide tools to directly support climate-relevant decision-making on the ground for mayors, for states, for the business community, and for NGOs. And that is just the start. Because at EPA, where it's most important, not just kidding, at EPA, we're using our, regular, uh, our regulatory authority that Congress has given us 
to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, taking into account the technologies available to us today and how we send the best market signal about the next generation of technologies we need moving forward. We're partnering with communities on the ground and we're collaborating across all levels of government and sectors of industry. We are using every tool that Congress has given us in our toolbox, and those tools are many. Just six years ago, EPA scientists documented that greenhouse gases were posing a threat to public health and welfare in the United States. This finding opened up the door to not just allow, but require greenhouse gases to be regulated under the Clean Air Act. It was one, and as we know, the Clean Air Act is one of the most successful public health statutes that has ever been written, with success that is unparalleled. This was a pivotal legal and scientific step forward to address the challenges of today with one of the best tools that we have had in the history of the United States. This finding was confirmed by the United States Supreme Court more than once, and there is no turning that clock back. American law requires that we act to reduce greenhouse gases, and that is exactly what we have been doing. Since then, we've been very busy. We set historic greenhouse gas standards that will send our cars twice as far on a gallon of gas by the middle of the next decade, saving American families money at the pump and revitalizing our auto industry. We already set standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles, and we're now going even further with a new rule to reduce one billion tons of emissions while saving consumers billions of dollars worth of fuel. On methane, we're taking four separate actions that together will reduce 400,000 short tons of methane in 2025. That's equal to cutting nine million metric tons of carbon dioxide. We're moving forward on hydrofluorocarbons. I'm getting tired even talking about these things. Those are HFCs. We have commitments already made by the U.S. government and the private sector, thank you, private sector, to reduce cumulative global HFC consumption by the equivalent of more than one billion metric tons of CO2 through 2025. That's equal to taking 210 million passenger vehicles off the road for an entire year. That is really big stuff. And internationally, the recent meeting of the parties to the Montreal Protocol in Dubai was a major step forward. Not an easy one for those of you that were there, but it was a major step forward. Countries across the world took the historic step to work together on a 2016 amendment to the Montreal Protocol to reduce both the production and the consumption of harmful HFCs. So we know that the global community can come together and they can act on climate in the ways that make sense for everyone. But last summer, as part of President Obama's climate action plan, EPA launched perhaps its most significant effort in its esteemed 45-year history when we launched our Clean Power Plan. It is the biggest single step America has ever taken to fight climate change. And with our plan, the U.S. is on track to slash carbon pollution from the power sector 32 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. And the cuts to smog and soot that come along with these reductions will bring health benefits for American families starting day one. Our plan, building on six years of effort by the Obama administration, means that in the year 2030, we will avoid thousands of premature deaths and trips to the hospital for our children and our elderly, tens of thousands of asthma attacks, and hundreds of thousands of missed school days and missed work days. But that's not all. We're also driving $45 billion a year in net climate and health benefits in 2030. And in that same year, the average American family will start seeing approximately 
the drum roll, $85 in annual savings on their utility bills. So don't tell me a clean energy future cannot happen. We are doing it starting today. But that's not all. Now we do recognize that there's no single path to a clean energy economy, even within the United States. Not every state is starting at the same place. Some generate more power from renewables, some from natural gas, some from nuclear, some from coal. That's why the Clean Power Plan gives individual U.S. states the flexibility they need to address and meet these pollution reduction requirements in whatever customized way works best for them. The key to this success is its flexibility. And that's a theme that applies inside the U.S. and beyond. We know that zero carbon renewables and clean, low carbon solutions are going to be an essential and growing part of our energy mix. That's where the jobs of the future are heading. But every fuel will continue to be a part of that future. Under the Clean Power Plan, all low carbon electricity generation technologies, including renewables, energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage, and more, can be used by states to meet their requirements. We are seizing on those diverse opportunities. America's approach is not the only approach. Countries are acting in ways that are nationally appropriate for them, and that's how it should and must be. And the U.S. is eager to share our experiences and the lessons we've learned along the way. We're learning and looking at closely at what's helped us to grow, and we want to share those lessons to help make sure that clean energy innovation across the world and those jobs across the world can flourish everywhere. Our success will be judged on how well we take advantage of newer, cleaner energy technologies and how well we send clear market signals that the private sector can follow. The Clean Power Plan works because it follows market trends that are already happening in the United States. The technologies and the innovations that are going to be the engines of the low carbon future are already here. Many of them are sitting on our doorstep waiting to be taken advantage of. We've seen that innovation is turning what was once impossible challenges into profitable opportunities. Just look at the U.S. solar industry, where we're now creating jobs 10 times faster than any other part of the sector of the U.S. economy. We know this can work because at EPA, we're building on that 45-year legacy, a legacy where we have reduced pollution 70 percent while we've tripled our GDP. And we know that jobs will carry us forward to cleaner energy, and they're the same ones that will make us a more inclusive society where we'll be able to meet our president's challenge to move people out of poverty and into the middle class, because they can do solar installations. They can do housing retrofits. They can teach and learn and move the jobs of the future, and they can be the entrepreneurs of the future. Countries who lead these areas will be the clear winners. That's why the Clean Power Plan makes sense on so many levels. And I want to reassure you that our plan will stick and it will stand the test of time. Should I say that again? It'll stick and it will stand the test of time. Why? Because we heard from millions of people in our initial proposal and we listened and we learned and we made changes. We heard substantive, real issues from states, utility companies, environmental organizations, and communities across our country. And we and they want the U.S. to lead. And you will hear this time and again, including in the panel that will follow. You know, folks, climate change isn't really about a challenge for polar bears, although I will tell you I love polar bears and I don't want anyone to think I'm anti-polar bears. However, I love my children, my three children, a little bit better. And when the Pope stands up and demands that we accept our moral responsibility to, the act, to act for the sake of our children and the most vulnerable people everywhere, then that message must go beyond politics. 
It speaks to all of our core values as human beings and to what matters most to all of us, no matter your politics, no matter where you live, no matter what your religion, we share a core value that must be recognized and moved forward in our actions on climate. We are well past debate on the science, and in the U.S., a large majority of Americans see climate change as a serious threat. They support the policies in our Clean Power Plan, and they want good, strong action right here in Paris in this conference. And I am looking forward to answering your questions, to having Janet McCabe, who is my acting assistant administrator at the Office of Air and Radiation, who has been the genius behind the delivery of so many of these vital, uh, of these vital rules and reductions, to join me on the stage so we can take some of your questions. Lastly, I just want to thank all of you. I see many faces out there that I have seen at many conferences. I'm hoping that they feel at the same way that I do, that the time for action is now and the time for this conference to finally succeed in getting strong, aggressive action moving forward is today. Thank you very much. And just to remind everybody watching over the internet, you can get your questions in using the hashtag AskUSCenter. And I hope everyone here has been jotting down questions they have um, for our two panelists on stage. So do we have any questions? Please raise your hand and some mics will come to you. Don't make them really hard. No, no, I wouldn't just do kidding, that. Just <laughs> My name is Kathy Lee. I'm from the firm Lee International from the state of Maine. And I want to thank you first for the leadership that you've shown all these years, including when you led Connecticut into the implementation of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. But thank you especially for what you're doing now. Um, my colleagues, since I've been at the COP, have been asking me, with the gridlock and lack of political will in the U.S. Senate, what form of agreement can come out of this event that the U.S. can sign on to that will have some legal impact in the United States? What do I tell them? Well, first of all, let me thank you, because I can remember you sitting in stakeholder meetings early on in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and you're still hanging out. Hope springs eternal. Now's the time to deliver on that, but thank you. Um, and and I, let, me, let me make this very clear. Um, the U.S. is here to make sure that all of these countries submit INDCs. The success of having 184 countries do that is enormous. And we, are, we believe that there is an opportunity here so that we don't have to make those goals required, but we have to have a consistent, transparent, stable reporting and in view, a review system so that we can see how every country is doing. We can form partnerships. We can direct research and development money. We can all do strong inventories to see where our emissions are rather than guess so that we can all hold hands, share information, and head off to a low carbon future. And the third issue is we need to recognize that there are vulnerable countries, countries that don't have sufficient capacity today to be able to deliver on, on both adaptation needs that they have, as well as opportunities for continued reductions and opportunities for continued jobs as we move to a low carbon future. And it's, and it's our job to make sure that those resources are available. And so we can continue to build capacity. That is the agreement we need, that's what we can deliver, and that's what we can promise on moving forward. Thank you, we'll take two questions at once, if that's all right. Sure. With, oh, great, two questions. Hi, thank you for being here, Administrator. Um, my name is David Rosenheim with the Climate Registry. Uh, and as you know, as our founding uh, chair, uh, we rep represent states, and states obviously play a critical role uh, in the Clean Power Plan. Uh, I want to let you both know that we're here with seven states, uh, including three governors and several uh, environment and energy commissioners. What role do you see for U.S. states in the international uh, process? I can't say negotiations because they don't have an official role, but as you know, states like California and others are really pushing the ball forward 
Um, how can states work in partnership with US EPA in the international process moving forward? Well, David, thank you. I'm sorry, sorry Janet. Uh, Oops, sorry, I, just one more here. here. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Hello, uh, my name is Kim Schumacher. I'm from the University of Tokyo in Japan. And uh, I wondered, uh, how do you feel about the potential futility of the measures that the APA is right now implementing? Because uh, after the next uh, presidential elections, uh, since most of them are through ex executive action, they could just be repealed. So how can uh, you assure that those uh, you that are more durable in the sense that like, yeah, they can, uh, stay even after a uh, shift in uh, like yeah uh, domestic policy well uh, let me take the first one and, and Janet is itching to take the second um, so on the first one thank you David and, and thanks to all the states who continue in the registry it's it's a wonderful thing and it allows them to understand where their emissions are coming from and and how to join together it's a very good model and that's really my message in two ways for state action First of all, I want to make it very clear that I'm a little biased. I worked for states for many more years than I've worked at EPA. I think we've done all the heavy lifting. EPA is just delivering it to the rest of the country. And, and uh, I, not to suggest that our job isn't difficult, but we are building on all of the work that states have done it, 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 and that industry has done as well. And so we are capturing the technologies and the models that states have already done and relying on them to continue the momentum moving forward. And with the Clean Power Plan, it is clear that there is huge momentum moving forward. States are participating. They are going to be, and they are developing their plans. They're doing the stakeholder meetings that are required for that. And we are very confident that states are going to continue to perform as they have before to be a vital part of the environmental fabric of this, of this country. And I thank them dearly for all of the work that they have done. And, and again, it is about a model. It's about recognizing that it can be done and there's more that we can do. And sharing that model with the rest of the countries here is a very important message. So this is real. This is available to us today. That you can say over and over and over because it's your commitment that has allowed us and EPA to move forward and advance these across the country and hopefully advance an international agreement. Janet. Yeah, if I could just uh, say one more word about that, uh, the, the important role that the states play. Um, the, the administrator mentioned how, or if she didn't, I'll mention it, how incredibly flexible the Clean Power Plan is. And one of the things that the states can do is show the many ways in which states can go about meeting these requirements in ways that fit their needs. Um, and, and it's going to be different from Reggie to California to states in the middle of the, of the country and the south of the country. And that's going to show how many opportunities there are here. So again, I think that's a really important thing for, for the uh, states within the United States to show. In response to the question about, uh, about how these rules are going to stick, um, I think this is a really important question because people do ask that, and, and, and we do have governments change in the United States. But we went through a lengthy and a very detailed and very open process to put these rules in place. We had to develop a significant record that will, um, uh, it had, was open to scrutiny and comment all the way. We have to do reasoned dis decision making consistent with the Clean Air Act and with, with all the jurisprudence that we have in the United States about how the government uh, through the executive agencies makes rules. And you can't just undo that by deciding I'm not going to do that. I'm a new president. A, a new administration would have to go through a similar effort and build a record with reasoned decision making in order to change these rules. And uh, that just doesn't happen that often. So that's what gives us the confidence that these rules are going to last. Can, can I just add to Janet so she added to mine? We're, we're, good, we're good at this. Um, I want to make sure that it, something else is very clear, that these are, this is not an executive order. This is using already existing executive authority. It is a rule. It is now law, OK? So, so in order to change that, you will have to go through every layer of the courts to successfully do that. And the record we had have is very substantive. So it's not an executive order. It's, it's what we call using the authority of the executive branch that's been given to it by Congress. So it is very solid legally. The second thing is 
you know, this president, because he has stood up and made his position so clear on the science and on the challenge ahead, and I think because of EPA and the other agencies, bringing that into clarity about what actions we can take that are so beneficial to addressing this as a serious public health and economic and security challenge has changed the tone of the conversation across the United States. And there is activity in every state that is now welcome. So while you might think there's huge controversies, there's votes, yes, there's vetoes to come, and there is tremendous positive engagement across the U.S. People care about this issue. They want this to move forward. That's what the next president is going to have as their context, and we're proud of that. Hi, my name is Caroline Engel, and I'm here with the Sierra Student Coalition, and I'm also a seventh generation Kentuckian. And so my question actually goes really well with the last one, which is do you have any advice uh, for people like myself, a young person living in a state where my representatives do not speak, um, going in with what you said about the legal bindingness of it, as well as just speaking for the concerns of needing the clean power plan in, this, in Kentucky? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Administrator McCarthy. Richard Eidlin from the American Sustainable Business Council. Thank you so much for the work you and Ms. McCabe have been doing. My question sort of follows up on that, which is how can the American business community uh, be most effective in promoting the rules and supporting the president's larger initiative? We're good at answering questions. We're not good at, at actually making decisions. Which one do you <laughs> All right, I'll do, I'll do the first one, you okay, do the second. Uh, in terms of con, con, uh, the issues around Kentucky, you know, it, it is very clear that, there, you know, that we're, we're still struggling to try to get the voice of the American people into all of the political uh, machinery and decisions that we make. But we'll, we will get there. And we're working very hard at making the case, and I'm very respectful of Congress and whatever actions they would like to take, but I know where the United States of America needs to go, and I know what my rules are, and I know how to get there. And so the, the president is, is very clear that he wants us to continue to meet with everybody, talk to Congress, talk about the validity of the actions we're taking and the need for them. And young voices are essential. I, I didn't want to point out that you're young, but you are. To me, most of you are. Uh, it, and it's, it's, we have so much, so many young youthful folks uh, at colleges, in universities, in their own communities, working for their own future. Their voices are getting raised. One of the things we made sure to do in this plan was to tell states that they need to have stakeholder engagement. Show up. Be there. Talk about it. Talk about what you need for your future. And I'd also point out that the president is not blind to the fact, nor are we, that we have to look at whether or not this transition we're already experiencing to clean energy is going to provide strains on some of our communities. And the answer to that is yes. And the president has proposed something he called the Power Plus proposal, which is a significant amount of billions of dollars to help support communities that are already feeling the impact of coal not being marketable in the energy system today throughout most of the country in the waning use of, of coal in our energy supply system. And, and it's an opportunity to help rebuild those communities, to work with them and see that how we do in the United States, what we've always done, is to not leave communities behind as there have been economic shifts. We have to take that same positive attitude instead of thinking that we can hold on to an industry that's been in decline for 40 plus years and turn that around to the detriment of public health, the economy, and our national security, and instead bring everybody together moving forward. So I, I have to add to that only because um, I, I'm, I come from Indiana. I live in Indiana. So I, I sympathize with the point that you're making. Um, it can be a challenge to be in that kind of an environment. Um, and you feel like no matter what you say, 
Um, that's not what gets reported in the newspaper. That's not what people are going to do. But I'm very encouraged when I, when I go back there. Um, there, there are um, at, at the universities, in the faith communities, there are people who have been saying these things, saying these things, and and I I'm really feeling and seeing a change in in the rhetoric. And it and it's going to take a while. And that's one of the great things about the system that we have in the Clean Air Act is that the federal government does provide that push to make sure that everybody has to be moving in the same direction. So, so I'm very encouraged, but I, I, I would echo what the administrator says, please show up. Um, we, we, the, the states really are taking seriously our direction to them to involve the community. They really are. If, in fact, if I had to say the one thing that we've gotten as, as many questions about as anything else is, what is it that you want us to do in terms of a, a, of a real stakeholder process? How can we do that? What, what advice can you give us? So let's make sure that we show them that it was worth doing that by having uh, people participate. Your question about, about uh, businesses, um, I, I think, really is a nice follow-on because uh, that that is, in addition to the the support, the innovation, um, leading the way, um, uh, being out there visible in the communities, showing that companies companies care about this just as much as. Uh, government does, or more. I mean, you, you, companies make up. That's where the people in this country work. That's where they get their goods and services. Um, they they pay attention to those things. You guys make news in your local communities. You can make news. You can talk to the the representatives in Kentucky and Indiana and let them know that you believe that these are important things to do, not just for public health and, and for the environment, but for the the, the health of uh, of vibrant businesses that that create jobs. There's lots and lots of opportunity through the Clean Power Plan, especially for companies that are are in the energy space, in the energy efficiency space, um, which which has broad tentacles. And I know that you guys all know this, so uh, I, I want you to know how much we encourage and applaud and appreciate uh, the, the kind of support that you, that you provide. You probably want to add to that. No, I think you did great. All right, great. All right, we have two more questions on complete opposite sides of the center here. Hi, Nianta Spellman with Rainforest Partnership. I'm here, sorry. Hello, Administrator McCarthy. Very nice to have you here. Um, first, a quick comment. Why is it that it's always women who are so often administrators and ministers of environment? I'll, I'll let because you comment. Because we're smarter and better? I think that, that could be it. I wanted you to say that. <laughs> yes. So I, I wanted to ask, um, what you do is amazing, and uh, you have to work really hard to bring the kind of plan you've brought forward and yet in the US, think about it, very few people know the role that the administration's playing. You often over the years, when I've come to the COP, you hear it at the COP, you go back home, and nobody knows what anybody's doing within the administration, any of the different uh, uh, departments. So I, I was gonna give a very quick uh, example. So rain, protecting tropical rainforests, very similar, especially when you're based in Texas, people say, why are you doing it? Do we have rainforests here? So to make it accessible, we did a couple of things. Film was one, but the second was bringing rainforest sounds, took them to New York during Climate Week, and then brought them to Paris. They hear on a couple of free apps, including on Eiffel Tower. Trying to make it accessible and bringing something to people because it's not so accessible. What can the EPA do? What are you doing to make the whole conversation about climate change more accessible and, and changing the course? that it's been on. Thank you. And we have one more over here. I'm uh, David Tucker, representing the Unitarian Universalist Association in the United States. Uh, and I also work for the Environmental Finance Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where we're delighted to have been a longtime collaborator with the EPA on many projects. Um, my question wearing my uh, religious NGO hat is this. For we're, we're a nation of freedom of religion, and for all of the, the faith-based community, whether Unitarians or Christians or Jews or Buddhists or Muslims or what have you, similar to questions that were asked from other sectors here, 
what is your advice on what we can do? As you mentioned, Administrator McCarthy, this really is a moral challenge, global warming, and it's a, a moral obligation for us to, to work to protect all of us, but especially the most vulnerable among us. What is your advice on how people of faith in the United States can work to advocate and support the administration's initiatives under the Clean Power Plan and, and the other things that you're doing such important work on? Thank you. Uh, let me uh, tackle the first question. Uh, one of the things I wanted, to, I, I wanted to make clear is I think part of the challenge of climate change has been to try to speak about this in ways that people relate. Sometimes we have been too distant, too far reaching. Instead of talking about what really matters to people, we have to make the connection that we are living in one world and that climate change is about our home no matter where that effort is taking place. And I think we're trying very hard to figure out across the administration how we work together to talk about climate change in much more real terms for people so that they don't have to, have to understand the science as much as understand the actions we're taking are consistent with the science and will benefit them and their families. And it is very challenging. It's been challenging for a long time. But one of the, th one of the tools we have available to us that was not available 20 or 30 years ago, which is when some of us started talking about this, is social media. You can reach people now like you've never been able to reach them before and provide data in a way that they can access it, they can make changes to it to see how the world changes as different inputs and, and actions are taken. So I think we have a huge responsibility to be much clearer to bring information to people and we're trying to do that every day. But I think, you know, you asked a, a funny question I think about women you know, providing more opportunities for leadership in the environmental world. You know, it is, it is true that we have had our share of women in the position of environmental administrator. And I think part of that is because in order to really get an environmental message across, you have to speak in a way that will, that will be accessible to people. I honestly think that women internalize issues very well and explain them well. I am not speaking at this level. I'm talking to you as a normal human being about the challenges we're facing and why it matters to my children. And I think we've had to do that with the environment. We've had to explain how we think about jobs. We think about putting food on the table. I'm not just thinking big thoughts. I'm thinking about real people in the full range of things they care about. That's how we have to talk about it. That's how we have to talk and present the issues on climate change. And so I, I think the, the other thing I would just mention in answer to this question, and I'll have Janet um, talk about the faith community and all the great work we're doing together. Uh, you know, the, the last issue is really not just that we have a, a social media and, and talking clearly, um, but about the fact that we have probably the best staff imaginable in the Environmental Protection Agency who are behind us gathering data, talking clearly, understanding impacts, and getting the job done. I have never seen more capable, more passionate, more mission-driven people than the people working at the Environmental Protection Agency. So our success is as a result of their tremendous work, and I just have to thank them. And if I could mention one person here, is Maurice LaFranc here? Maurice, if you're not here, it's because you're working hard. He has been at these COPs for 18 years, working to support the State Department in agreements moving forward. He has retired, but he has, is back here as a technical expert, unwilling to give up the challenge until it's over the finish line. That's who we need to thank for the progress moving forward. It, uh, the, the faith community is incredibly powerful. I've lost, there you are. Um, incredibly powerful. And, um, uh, we, we work with them a lot. And, uh, and uh, before coming to EPA, um, I was very active in Indiana with the faith community. So let me tell you three reasons why, why, why they are. Um, one is the, the influence that um, representatives of, of the faith community can have in their local communities and with their elected officials. Um, and this draws back to the question um, from the young woman from Kentucky. 
um, the, it, it is incredibly powerful, and, and you know that. And, um, and, and leaders of faith communities, especially when they come together, can deliver a message that, that is not just an environmental message. It is a, a human message. It's a moral message. And you speak to people in power just in different ways than, than government can. So that's, that's one. Number two is that, um, the, that faith communities have such an ability to educate. People come into their faith community ready to learn and, and wanting to, to be better people and be, be responsible and be moral, whatever the tenets of that faith are. So many of those tenets are common across faiths, especially when it comes to these kinds of issues. And the, the, um, the information that can be conveyed in that setting, again, is so much more powerful than EPA can do, even through the best social media. And it speaks to people in different ways. Uh, I, I was involved in the Green Committee at, at my Unitarian Universalist congregation in Indianapolis. And, and you, you, you teach amazing things to people that they can internalize, do at home, but also become spokespersons for those issues in the community. And then the third way I, I think that faith communities are so critical um, is uh, in the way that they, actually there are four ways, I'm sorry, there are four ways. Third is children and, and how much children can learn and, uh, and be brought up to think about these issues in, in critical ways and understand how important they are. And fourth is the support that the faith community provides to the most vulnerable among us. And talk about a way in which messages come together um, and, and you can bring all aspects of the community into these faith discussions and faith communities to do it. So we, we have great partners in the, in the faith community and love the opportunity to work with them um, and, and think that, th that, that we, we, we need your help, you need our help uh, to get these messages across. So thank you for, for doing that work. Could I just add one more thing um, on, the, on how we can work more effectively with the faith-based communities? Is that the U.S. Has, has recently pledged, and this is an initiative led by EPA and USDA, to reduce our food waste, to cut it in half by 2030. Now, it is shocking that in the United States, 30 to 40 percent of our food never gets eaten, never gets consumed. It's wasted along the way. When you think about the amount of methane that is generated by wasted food, it is enormous. And when you think about the number of individuals whose lives could be saved and bettered by receiving that food, it is disgraceful that we are wasting this much. And, and the business community is embracing this as much as anybody else. So talk about an issue that is common to every faith. It is food. And it is our recognition that poverty must be attacked because there was a secretary uh, of the environment named Guerra in Mexico who is now their ambassador, Mexico's ambassador to Rome, who is one of my favorite individuals because when he gave a speech once with me, he said that the biggest challenge to the environment is poverty. It turned my head around. I'm with him. If the faith community can embrace this and connect the dots doing things like our food recovery challenge, being active in working with their grocery stores, with their families, to make sure that food gets to families in need, we can change not this, just the dynamic around poverty in the U.S., but we can change climate change as well. And so I'm excited about bringing more efforts to the table that people can actively engage in to be part of the climate change solution. And the faith-based community is going to be a huge component of making that happen. Thank you. And thank you for that. I will note on Friday at the U.S. Center, we have an event about faith-based communities and the actions they're taking on climate change. So that seems like something that would be very interesting for a lot of you. We're running up a little bit short on time, so we want to make sure we give the panel discussion after this uh, plenty of time to talk. So I'd like everyone to thank Administrator McCarthy and Janet McCabe for their question and answer session. And I'd also like to invite our panel to the stage. Uh, the upcoming panel will be on the Clean Power Plan, Challenges, and Business Opportunities. And moderating this discussion 
is Michael J. Bradley. Michael is formed MJ Bradley and Associates in 1994 to provide clients with insightful policy and business advice on energy markets, environmental regulations, and on climate change strategies. And I will turn over the stage to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, we're, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from businesses and hear about uh, how they are reacting and taking advantage of uh, not only the Clean Power Plan, but the signal that is out there now in terms of uh, a carbon price. Um, when, um, when we met with EPA many times as they were developing this rule, we asked for three things. We asked for a very meaningful rule that would really create significant reductions in greenhouse gases. We asked for the rule to be uh, litigation, uh, um, have, have litigation risk that's very low. And we asked for a simple rule, a straightforward rule. Well, we got the, the, um, the massive reductions. We got the minimal litigation risk, which Gina conveyed. But we didn't get a simple rule. We got a rule that took me about a week to read um, and states to digest. And uh, there's been a lot of education. But my sense is that people are coming around to really realize that it is a pretty simple approach uh, as they look at their opportunities. And we're going to hear about three leading companies that um, have uh, had <clears throat> their carbon strategies really underway for a long time. And the clean power plan is just another strong driver for, uh, for these companies. Uh, I'm very happy to have these three representatives here from companies that are really making a difference. We have Kathy Willems from Berkshire ha Hathaway Energy. Kathy is the Senior VP for Environment and the Chief Environmental Council. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway has been a real lead, and she'll talk about their lead in the wind and solar sectors. We have Thad Hill, who's the President and CEO of Calpine Corporation. Thad has a long history in the energy uh, field. Uh, working for a variety of other companies. Uh, he's been with Calpine for about eight years now, then. And uh, they have an amazing, efficient fleet of combined cycle natural gas plants across the country. They're the lead uh, company in the US, probably the world, in geothermal energy. So we'll hear more about that. And then we have Helen Burt from PG&E Corporation, uh, based in San Francisco. Uh, Helen's a senior VP for external affairs and public policy, and so she's in charge of the federal, the state outreach, and, and working with communities, but also focused on policy. She has a strong role in PG&E sustainability program, which is one of the um, most effective that I've seen in the, in the country. So I'm going to ask each of them to uh, speak about their experiences for several minutes each. Uh, and then we'll come back and take some questions. So we'll start with Thad. Uh, thanks, Michael, and uh, we're pleased to be here today. Uh, Michael gave a quick introduction to Calpine, um, but we are a national power generator. We operate about 85 power plants in 20 states across the United States and generate enough power for somewhere between 25 and 30 million homes. Um, our 85 plants, 15 are geothermal. Um, those are located in Northern California. In fact, Helen and her company are a customer of ours. Um, uh, 70 of the 85 plants are natural gas, uh, the youngest, most flexible, cleanest fleet out there in the United States. Uh, we've been a supporter of the Clean Power Plan um, since it began. We also supported Reggie um, in the East and AB 32 in California and a variety of other environmental regulation. The really two corporate principles we have that underlie the way we run our business and our advocacy efforts. Number one is environmental stewardship, and number two are free and competitive markets yield better outcomes, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, one of the great things about the Clean Power Plan is we think it enables both. Um, what the Clean Power does is provide a framework for the states to develop market-based and cost-effective approaches to achieving emissions. Um, we've been supportive for this, as I mentioned, because of our market-based views. Our portfolio of assets um, really are geothermal, clearly is a carbonless source of generation. Our natural gas plants actually represent a real way to help achieve reductions by share gain, and they're also very needed in the world of um, renewables 
where you actually need to manage renewable integration. And our plants are very important to that, and in fact, do that today in California uh, in a very real way every day. Um, you know, of course, the work in Washington, uh, well, the work won't be done. It would not be fair to the, uh, to the administration of the EPA. But, but certainly our attention very shortly will be turning to the states because although the EPA provides a great framework, how the states actually take the framework and implement it, we think matters a lot to getting to the right outcomes. Um, you know, we are very hopeful that the states where we are, um, you know, will, will pursue a state plan that is mass-based, um, that allows trading of credits between different states, um, and treats new and existing resources equally. Uh, the importance to us of trading between states is that is when you operate in different states, you get to make the most efficient dispatch decisions and get the most carbon reduction when you have a common price target. So we hope uh, that's where things go. Uh, one final point for us, I talked about market-based up front. Um, one of the reasons we like the Clean Power Plan so much is because it prices carbon. Um, I've got uh, a little bit of economic training, and uh, the, most, the best thing you can do is put a price on something and let the free market and business work to get there. To talk about Calpine for a minute, uh, I mentioned we operate geothermal and natural gas plants. Um, you know, one of the issues, while we haven't been in wind or solar, is that we have no tax appetite at Calpine. So the reason why these uh, technologies have been economic up to this point is because they're tax credits. What the Clean Power Plan ultimately will do, will put a price on carbon, replacing the tax credits, which will enable companies like us and others um, to, you know, be much more active in a, in a way uh, than we've been able to, to at this point. So with that. Oh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just want to, uh, I want to acknowledge the great work that Administrator McCarthy and Deputy McKay, uh, the Clean Power Plan was truly collaborative. Uh, you guys did get a lot of information from stakeholders. We commented, I don't know how many times we attended meetings, and so did a lot of our colleagues at the state policy level, uh, and even consumer groups. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that it's going to stand the test of time, and I do think it's a, it's a really good program. So let me talk a little bit about, first about sort of um, climate in California and the leadership in California. And, and to do that, I, I sort of have to set the context. Uh, we actually have to go back in time to the 70s, believe it or not, when some really bold people sat around the table and decided to really change the business model for utilities. And if you can imagine, they actually were so bold to presume that something as nebulous as energy efficiency should be considered a boiler fuel. Now that was a fundamental change in policy, and it changed everything. I can tell you, I personally, attended a retirement party of an employee who had been with our company 35 years, always in energy efficiency. Our company has a tremendous commitment to energy efficiency, and our customers take it for granted. That policymakers and the people that sat around that room really changed the way California operates, and that's the beginning of how we started to do the right thing for climate. Um, as a result, the per capita use uh, in California among our, uh, all of our uh, utility uh, usage is roughly flat. The rest of the United States is about 50% increased in the last 30 years. And then in the 2000s, the, the notion of bringing renewables online began to be popular. And we started with 10% and 20% and then 30%. And just this year, uh, and the utility supported uh, our bill to make renewables 50%. And so we have a 50% target for renewable energy to be delivered to customers. We think that's incredibly important. We've also invested in smart grid, and this is a part of the policy. Uh, at pg e we have 10 million smart meters in the field. Um, then in 2006, and I think this is kind of an, another important uh, sort of context setting, uh, California set AB 32, which really started to put carbon and a price on carbon. It set up the whole cap and trade program that's now, I guess, four years old in California. It's been very effective. And so I would say sort of contextually, um, one of the things that's unique about California is that the policy uh, policymakers and the regulators 
really support investment in clean energy. I would say secondarily, they recognize the really fundamental role that utilities play. So everybody comes together to make it successful. Now for PG&E, what does that mean for us? If we look at where we are today, um, we today uh, give 30% renewable power across the board. But now we have a very narrow definition on renewable in California. If we, if we include all of our hydro facilities and we include the nuclear facilities, we're over 55% of uh, the power that we provide to our customers is carbon free. And that's the way we talk about it. And we think that's the important issue. Um, we also support our customers when they put solar, rooftop solar on. We've got 200,000 rooftops with rooftop solar. We've really invested time in trying to make that an easy process for customers. And we've got 25% of all the rooftop solars in the United States are in our service territory. And we're quite proud of that. Um, we've got more electric vehicles. We've got over 70,000 electric vehicles that are connected to our grid. Um, and we're investing in grid scale battery storage. So now what does all this mean? We've talked about the context and, and how we've gotten here in California. So there's sort of three things that we think about from this. One is, from a technical perspective, there's a lot of people worried about, is this possible? And I can tell you it's absolutely possible. We've integrated all of these different resources into a very viable, reliable grid, and that matters. And I would say secondly, from a cost perspective, uh, the, the bills that our customers pay are among the lowest in the United States. A lot of that has to do with energy efficiency. And I'd say the third thing is, I think there's been uh, no doubt that using the scale that comes available from utilities really helps. You know, I can look at all of the investments we've made over the last 10 years and I can tell you, you know, it's so much less expensive to put grid scale solar on now than it was five years ago than it was seven years ago. And all of that's because this, of the, the, really the value of scale. So we've got one thing we wanted to say about the future, and that's that we think there's three things that are important that we think about. Uh, one of them is, again, thinking about this utility scale, it does matter, and we, when we look across the United States, should take advantage of this amazing electric grid that is out there. And we should use the scale of utilities to really invest in clean energy. And I would say, secondly, we need to rethink the business model. I think about the people that sat around in 1970 and dreamed about energy efficiency as a boiler fuel, which I can't even imagine. We have to think that creatively now, and the time is now, because the grid needs to be viable, and it needs to be a part of the fabric that brings a carbon-free economy. And then I would say probably the third thing is, and I think this is what's so brilliant about the Clean Power Plan, is that we have to keep the focus on carbon. You know, a lot of people want to say, oh, what about this and what about that? And what about, well, it's about renewables. Well, it's about solar. Well, it's about solar rooftops. It's about carbon. And if we just keep the focus on carbon and we rely on the things that make the clean power plan really powerful, which is the flexibility and everybody coming to the table with a variety of solutions, uh, I think we're going to really find ourselves in an amazing position five years from now and ten years from now. And it's very possible that, you know, 30 years from now, somebody will be talking about the Clean Power Plan the same way we're talking about the, uh, the policymaker who thought energy efficiency could be a boiler fuel. So uh, we're looking forward to working with regional areas and to really, really step this up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to start with um, just basically commending uh, Administrator McCabe, uh, Assistant Administrator McCabe and Administrator McCarthy um, for what really amounts to recognition of business achievements. I can say that under previous administrations, you know, I, I think all of us up here have done a lot, um, but it wasn't until this administration that you started to recognize the value of the things that we've done. And we haven't always been very vocal in talking about them. So I appreciate the opportunity to um, talk about it and to get that, that sense of recognition. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, Energy is a holding company uh, with a number of operating utilities that are vertically integrated, meaning we have both the generation and the lines and connect to your homes. Um, we also have some independent power producers. We actually formed a renewables uh, company back in 2011 for the sole purpose, really, of deploying renewables throughout the country in a time of greater customer demand for it. Um, we have 11.5 million customers worldwide, 
And of course, that doesn't just include um, the United States. We have operations in Canada, in the United Kingdom, and in the Philippines. Uh, so our, our reach is very wide. We have about 33,000 megawatts of generation. And really, it's, it's kind of a third, a third, a third. Um, and we're working on the, the percentages of those um, uh, resources, but about 34% of our um, generation is non-carbon. Uh, and that didn't come by accident. It came by a lot of people working really hard um, with policymakers, as we are here, uh, to advance that level of, of renewable generation. Um, interestingly, as well, we have um, a little over 32,000 uh, miles of transmission lines around the country. So we're um, very big into uh, the, the transmission piece that we think um, it will take to um, advance the renewable uh, scene even further. Um, with our Pacific Horn, Envy Energy, and um, AltaLink partners, our operating companies, we're the largest transmission owner in the Western interconnection. Um, likewise, we also have uh, more than 16,000 miles of natural gas transmission pipelines. Uh, so we are able to get um, a lot of natural gas around the country, and really, um, the, our pipelines deliver about 8% of the natural gas in the United States. Um, our solar facilities in California um, constitute about 6% of the solar market in the United States. Uh, we've got uh, more than 6,000 megawatts of wind under operation or construction around the United States. That constitutes about 8% of the wind market. And I'm not here to, to talk about market mo monopolization in as much as this is just one company um, that collectively, with all our operating companies, can achieve some pretty um, remarkable uh, advancements uh, in the way energy is produced. Now, if we go to you know, something like our, our commitment, we were the first energy or util electric utility to um, sign up for the President's um, American Business Act on Climate Pledge, and I think all of us here are, are, are part of that effort. Um, you recognize the level of commitment when you consider the fact that we had already spent 15 billion, with a B, dollars on renewables, and part of our commitment is to spend another 15 billion dollars on advancing renewables. Uh, so not an insignificant commitment, and, and one we feel really good about from a business and a customer perspective. What we found, for example, in the state of Iowa, where in 1983, a renewable portfolio standard, the first RPS in the United States was adopted, and it was 105 megawatts. Today, that RPS is 105 megawatts. What our portfolio looks like, however, in Iowa is more than 4,000 megawatts. And you know what? We were able to deploy those additional megawatts in the state of Iowa, you know, in the middle of the country, with no rate cases for our customers for 16 years. So it does go to show you that if deployed in the right manner um, and the right schedule, that it can save customers money. Now, that doesn't mean that under the Clean Power Plan, all our states are similarly situated. And I think that's part of the beauty of the plan itself is that um, we recognize that we've got flexibilities there. We're going to work hard with our states, um, sta some states in which we operate have a much heavier lift, um, but we want to work with them to come up with those creative solutions and, and make sure that the plan is executed in a very successful, successful fashion. And with that, Michael, I'll turn it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's rather inspiring to hear these stories. Uh, the paradigm shift is happening. Uh, there's many other companies that are uh, taking uh, measures similar to these three. These happen to be three uh, very impressive leaders. And um, from everything I see happening around the clean power plan, I think we're going to achieve it at a cost that no one can, can um, really appreciate. It's going to be very, very cost effective. Uh, we've heard a lot of stories about how it could be excessive, but these examples, PG&E doing what it's doing, and keeping the, the, the consumer price below the national average. Amazing. Um, so um, 
I'd like to open up this to uh, any questions that anybody else might have. Um, I have a few if, uh, if we want to go there, but. I'm William McPherson, retired Foreign Service officer and member of the Unitarian Church. We're very concerned, talking about Berkshire Hathaway, about oil and coal transportation in the Northwest. I live in Seattle. We have coal trains coming through every day, many oil trains coming through, and we're cur currently worried about the explosive nature of those trains. <laughs> I know that railroads don't always have a choice in the cargo they take, but if BNSF, owned by Berkshire Hathaway, could somehow consider the effects of the trains that come through the Northwest, we would be uh, very appreciative. So with, with full disclosure, I represent only the energy portion of our organization, um, which is Berkshire Hathaway Energy and the BSF BNSF organization, um, while part of the larger Berkshire organization, uh, is not represented here. Uh, but I will certainly um, ensure that your concerns are are relayed. Um, you know, we are we are definitely in the in the area of, of renewables and not necessarily on the coal transportation side. So, my apologies for not being able to answer your question, uh, but I will relay your concerns. Hello, uh, my name is Dan Hooper from the UNFCCC Secretariat, uh, but I'm from San Francisco, so I know all about PG&E. Uh, when it comes to the opposition of the Clean um, Power Plant Act, what would your message be to power plants that might think this will cost a lot of money, it can't be done, it might shut down certain plants, because you guys are the leaders, as we've been seeing, in embracing this and making it work for you and for your customers. So what would the message be or advice going forward for other uh, power facilities um, to transition this into a positive for them and their customers? Maybe I'll start. Um, uh, we certainly operate in some states where the Clean Power Plan is not very popular. Um, we operate in some states where it is. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I think this gets at the cost of compliance. With shale gas, and, and, and the already ongoing shifts that are occurring, you know, I'm not certain, um, as Michael mentioned, that the final cost of compliance will be that much at all. Things are happening already that are moving the country, as Administrator McCarthy talked about, to a much lower cost carbon environment. Um, shale gas is moving massive amounts of generation from coal to natural gas. Energy efficiency is happening. So, you know, I'm not certain when we get to 2030 and look back and the targets are achieved that, that um, it would have cost anything incremental at all, I think is the first point. The second point, um, you know, that I would make is that there's a cost right now embedded in a lot of the tax credits that are being provided to renewable providers. You know, we're swapping out that cost for a cost of carbon, but it's not necessarily a new incremental cost on society anyway. It's just changing the price signaling. So in our view, you know, without much incremental cost, we're going to get to where we need. And, and um, you know, it just makes a lot more sense to look at the, tr this is another step in a continuing trend of the transformation of uh, the generation resource in the country. Yeah, yeah, I would agree, I would agree with that. And I, I do think, again, the real power of the plan is the fact that it's so incredibly flexible. And it really takes into account wherever the state or region is starting, and it allows people to come to it in their own way. I, I also think, and we had this discussion a little bit earlier with a different group, I also think it's a natural, it's a natural position in the power business to be very reticent um, on, on big change. We tend to be in a, in a, in a business that thinks 30 years ahead. And we think about our obligation to serve, which means that we're always there, and we take that really seriously. So when you think about the makeup of the folks who are running the power plants and running the utilities in the United States, they come from a place of really being cautious about 
embracing something. They're afraid it might be more expensive. They're afraid it might not work. And some of that is just going to take us some time to get through. I, I completely agree, especially with shale gas. I, I think that natural change is happening, and the market's pushing it that way. So I, I think you're going to find it's not going to be more expensive, and I think people will express their concern, but I think as we get on the other side of it, it's just not going to be there. Just one thing to add, really for us as an organization, it's all about our customers. Everything we do in making these types of decisions is about our customers. And I, that's, I think that's the message I would send to you know, some of the um, entities that are less um, likely to be supportive, is if you really think about what's good for your customers, the rest will come with it. And that's really the essence. I also think there's been a long history of EPA regulations and state involvement that uh, have affected the electric sector, going way back to smog and acid rain, NOx controls, mercury controls, and others. And the industry has a tremendous track record at pulling the resources together, coming up with the innovation, getting the engineers focused on a job to be accomplished, and it is accomplished quite frequently at a cost a lot less than what EPA projected it to be. And this is going to fit into that mold very much. All right, we have time for just a few more questions. Does anyone have any questions in the audience or online? Remember, hashtag Ask US Center. Yes, um, I'm Greg Margita. I'm uh, representing the ACS. Um, and I'm actually a college student um, in uh, Iowa. So regarding regarding wind energy, I'm just you know I know that Iowa is really windy, and I see a lot of windmills around. And I'm just wondering to what extent can we uh, deploy wind energy to like the the less windy places? So I'm a lawyer and not an engineer. I'll start with that caveat, but. Um, you know, I think certainly advances in technology are making it more and more feasible to do that. Um, to give you an example, uh, we just started a pilot project um, where we're constructing a wind turbine um, using concrete as the tower rather than um, steel. And that allows us to actually build a higher tower, which brings the turbine up higher, which um, will likely give us a greater capacity factor. So I think as we look at some of those opportunities for that technological advancement, and it might be something simple like a material supply that gives us more opportunities. So I, I think those are the kinds of examples that we need to take advantage of. You know, I, I, I think you know, part of the brilliance of the clean power plan and what the EPA has constructed is that you don't have to do the same thing everywhere. If it's not windy somewhere, you can use solar panels. If you don't have either, you can burn clean natural gas. And it actually has the ability, um, depending on how the states implement it, to actually um, you know, be able to trade among states. So a state that is windier than a state that isn't, the state that is less windy can help economically support wind if the state chooses to do that. So the great thing about the plan is that you don't have to do everything the same everywhere. You can actually, economics will work, and we'll get to the kind of the least cost, best fit example. So, you know, if you can do more wind somewhere, great. If you can't, that's okay, too. The economics will work in a way that you're still going to get the carbon reduction. Great. I'd like to uh, invite Administrator McCarthy up for some closing remarks. Um, we love her enthusiasm. It's amazing. I feel like I have nowhere to go but down after that uh, conversation because we have, you know, three industry leaders, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Calpine, and PG&E, who stand up and talk about brilliance of an EPA rule. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Um, no, I really, I really appreciate it. I appreciate their leadership tremendously. You know, I, I think the funny little secret is that EPA and the utility industry has a long history of working together and listening to one another. And I think that's just never been as, as robust um, and as apparent as the work we did on the Clean Power Plan. It would not have been this kind of rule had they not come to the table before, 
the proposal was written, during the time that the proposal was being commented on, and they helped us substantively make this what it was. And I cannot thank them enough for all of their commitment, because I think many times we in public sector think that we're the only ones delivering public service. They're delivering public service as well, and I thank them for their dedication. And I also want to recognize Michael Bradley, who many of you may not know, I've known for many years, because he actually worked in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts for a while. Um, and he has been just tremendous in, in moving forward with the Clean Energy Group to always present new innovations and new thinking and to work in a collaborative way on everything from our clean air rules to the work we did in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And I want to thank him for his continued leadership. What many of you may not know is that he's out working with states on behalf of this group to make sure they have the coolest tools imaginable to figure out how they can look at different strategies for uh, achieving the Clean Power Plan um, in a way that's going to get this plan over the finish line in every single state. So I thank them all for that. And I want to make sure that we keep this conversation going. Because I have also been at an event with the Edison Electric Institute, which is a lot broader constituency uh, than you see represented here. And they have stood up and said that their utilities can achieve the standards in the Clean Power Plan. So while we, while we are here talking about this, please keep in mind to congratulate these utilities that have been the leaders of today because they are actually setting themselves and other utilities forward to be the leaders of tomorrow. And I want to thank them for all of their work and let them know that as much as we listened before, we're going to keep on listening. And their work with states and yours will never be more important than it is right now. So thank you all very much, and thank you for listening. And Michael, thank you for your tremendous leadership. And thank you, Minister, Administrator, for this wonderful event. We have a lot still planned here at uh, the U.S. Center, so make sure you